story behind that song. Yeah, that was D.L. Moody campaign many years ago. D.L. Moody was a big time Baptist preacher out of Chicago that traveled the world over. And his song leader became Philip Bliss, P.P. Bliss. And P.P. Bliss wrote a lot of our hymns or the music for him. Matter of fact, he wrote the music for It Is Well With My Soul. A lot of other songs you sing. Died in a train wreck in Ashtabula, Ohio. He, um, D.L. Moody was preaching a sermon and there's lighthouses on Lake Erie and there's an upper and a lower lighthouse. Tells you how to get into the harbor. And it was a stormy night captain was trying to find the harbor and he seen the upper lighthouse or what they thought was the upper lighthouse but the other lighthouse wasn't burning of course it's years ago no anything you know and they were arguing about well is the lighthouse which lighthouse is it well they chose the wrong one obviously the ship ran aground and crashed under the rocks and D.L. Moody preached a sermon on that and said that Christ is our upper lighthouse and that that lighthouse is always burning because it's Christ, but the lower lighthouse is our responsibility. The lighthouse here, the lower lighthouse. So that's why it says, let the lower lights be burning. Cast your gleam across the wave. Some poor fainting, struggling seaman, you may rescue, you may save. And P.P. Bliss heard that sermon by D.L. Moody, and he went home and wrote that song, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning. Um, pretty good story, huh? A uh, pretty good story behind that hymn, I think. So every time I sing that hymn, I think of the, we're the lower lights, aren't we, in that song. We're the lower lights. Christ is the upper light, and we're the lower lights. You know, I said this morning there were two churches in Revelation that John had nothing, or Christ through John had nothing bad to say about, Smyrna and Philadelphia. Um, Philadelphia, we're going to go through these last two churches tonight, and then we're going to start on the body. Actually, we're going to do a little bit kind of on some stuff out of Revelation, then we'll start into Revelation. Uh, did the angel church of Philadelphia write, He is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have a little power, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and make them know that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Behold fast what you have, so no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Philadelphia was a wealthy town, large Jewish population. It's uh, the next in our round before we get to Laodicea. And although Laodicea was only about 37 miles from Philadelphia, there was really no comparison in these churches. Laodicea, we'll talk about, said the holds the key of David. We talked this morning about Matthew 16, where Jesus tells, or Peter tells, or Jesus tells Peter, he says, Behold, I give you the keys of the kingdom, what you bind shall be bound, what you loose shall be loosed. But the reference in this is not really Matthew 16. The reference in this is Isaiah 22, 22, where basically it says, I'm going to put on your shoulder the key of David. And what that means to a Jew, David's key was, to, was the Messianic key because he would sit on the throne of David, Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. So when he said to them, I, I, when he said, I have the key of David, it means I'm the only way to heaven. I'm the only way. Jewish, the Jewish way won't work because they're persecuted by these Jews. And because of that, he said, I have the key and I have the key of David, which was a big thing, because he's saying, I'm the one. I'm the only one who can unlock that. Nobody else can do it. Um, I'm the one that has that, because the keys is what gives them authority, and the keys are what open doors. So he naturally goes into this thought that, you know, I'm going to open a door that no one can shut and shut a door that no one can open. In other words, what I do, what Christ does, 
It's something that cannot be undone. It's something that he's going to do it, and nobody else can change it. And then we talk about doors, just like in Matthew 16. The door that we're talking about, when he tells Peter, he says, I give you the keys of the kingdom, what you bind, I'll bind, what you loose, to be loosed. When we talk about that door, he's talking about salvation. He's talking about entrance into the kingdom because that's what Peter did. Peter opened the door to the kingdom on the day of Pentecost to the Jews, and Peter opened the door to the Gentiles in Matthew chapter 10 to the, Gen- to the household of Cornelius. It was the entrance into salvation, entrance into, into heaven. So it's no different when Jesus says that. I'm going to open a door that no one can shut. And I'm going to close a door that no one can open. And the door he's closing is the door of Judaism. The door that says I can go to heaven by being a Jew. And I'm opening the door. And that's what he says. These Jews are going to come and bow at your feet. In other words, I'm going to put them in subjection under you because I'm the one who holds the key. Not they do, but I do. And I'm going to do that. And they're the synagogue of Satan, uh, Jesus calls them. So they were very persecuted here. There was a lot, apparently a lot of Jewish persecution in here. And they were very persecuted by the Jews. He says you had a little strength. And that doesn't mean that they're not strong. Because spiritually, this is a very strong church. Very strong church. So he's not saying you have a little strength by your your faith. He's probably not even saying you have a little strength by your numbers. But what he is saying, and what's true of all these churches is you have a little, you have very little influence. In other words, you can't do much with the Jewish synagogue. You can't do much with the Romans. You can't do much with the Greeks. You don't have any power. In other words, you're here, but you have very little power, very little power to change anything, to influence anything. And he's telling them, he says, you have very little strength, very little influence here is what he's saying. But he says, you've kept my word. You've persevered. You've kept my word. You've not denied my name. You know, that's really something to say that. You're weak. You have very little influence. You're persecuted by those other people. But yet you've endured. You've endured. Other churches that we talk about in Revelation, they didn't, right? They didn't endure. But this church did. What's the difference? I don't know. You know, I just don't know what the difference is in this congregation. Whether it's the leadership, whether it's the people, whether it's, I don't know. But for some reason, this church, even though they're tested and tried like all the other churches, they've stayed faithful. They've stayed faithful to what God wants them to do. And even though they have a little strength, little influence, they haven't denied Jesus. And that's a big thing because he's saying you haven't recognized the Caesars as God is what he's saying. You haven't done that. You haven't pinched incense or kissed the bus of Caesar and said Caesar's a god. You haven't denied my name. That's really what we're talking about at this time when we're talking about emperor worship because that's what's going on in, 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 in Asia Minor at this time. It's going on throughout Rome at this time is emperor worship. And when you, was, when you would pinch incense or you would do something to the emperor, you would deny the name of Jesus. So he said, you haven't denied my name. So that's why they don't have any influence. That's why they don't have any power, because they won't recognize the Caesars as God. And because of that, they don't have citizenship. They don't have recognition. And so they've lost their power. It's the aorus tense, which that might not mean a lot to you, but basically aorus tense means when it says you haven't denied my, my name, it means that basically there's no time to that. In other words, they haven't denied it in the past, they haven't denied it in the present, and they were not going to deny it in the future. In other words, it's not a time thing. You haven't denied it. You're not going to deny it. It's very important the way he says that in the tense of the Greek. In other words, he's saying you're steadfast in it regardless. You've been that way. You're going to be that way. So it's really kind of a neat, kind of a neat way that he says that. He says the Jews are going to fall down at your feet. No condemnation to this church whatsoever. Um, Didn't say one thing that they needed to repent of, one thing that they needed to do different, one thing that they needed to change. No condemnation. But there is a promise. He says, I'll keep you from the hour of trial, which is soon to come, it says here. So persecution is going to increase. We know that. How how he kept them from the hour of trial, I don't know. I I don't know the answer to that question. But he promised them, he says, I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial. In other words, you're not going to have to come through this hour of trial that's quickly going to come. I'm going to write my name on you. That's a huge thing in the book of Revelation. The idea of writing my name, sealing you, um, saying that you're mine. Not physically. This isn't, you know, you got to get that out of your head when we read Revelation. He's not physically saying I'm going to write my name on you 
on your forehead or whatever, you know, all these things we hear out of Revelation. But he means I'm going to know your mind. I'll know your mind. I'm going to seal you. You know, and isn't that what he says? I'm going to seal you with the Holy Spirit of promise. In other words, I'm going to seal you with mine. I'm going to know your mind. And we're going to talk a lot about that writing my name a little bit later on. And I'll make more sense out of that. We'll make some Old Testament stuff out of the book of Daniel. Hopefully it'll make more sense. He says, I'm going to make you pillars in the temple of my God. Pillars are what supports a building, right? That's the support. That's the structure. It's not necessarily pretty, right? But without it, the building would fall down, <laughs> right? So he's saying, you're not the most flashy. You're not the prettiest. But guess what? You're the pillars. You're the ones that are going to hold it up because your faith is that strong. Your faith is going to hold it up. And you're going to be a pillar in the temple of my God. And I'm going to give you a new name. Once again, we're going to talk a lot about names. Names are important. We've seen that before. I'm going to write a name on your stone that no one knows. I'm going to give you a new name. Change, change the names and change the life. A change of who you are. Abram, Abraham, Sarah, I, Sarah. A change the name. Saul, Paul. Change the life. So that's what he's saying here. I'm going to give you a new name. Laodicea is kind of an interesting church. Um, a lot of things we see in here, in these churches, the reference in Revelation has reference to their geography, and I hope you've seen that over these churches, their geography, their trade, their way of make a living. He's making reference, and that tells us he's specifically talking about these churches and not a period of time or a bigger scope, but particularly these churches. Laodicea maybe is the most, uh, the best example of that. Laodicea is a town that was known for its black wool. It was known for, uh, for that. That was something that was big there, was black wool. Uh, the dying of black wool, which it seems kind of interesting. No one's talking about white. Laodicea was also a place that really had no water. So their water was carried in by an aqueduct. And Laodicea was destroyed several times over the course of history by earthquakes. Their water came in by an aqueduct, but not only that, it had a siphon system at the bottom, very before its time, very interesting. Uh, a lot of that aqueduct still remains in ruins. It's the very last church we'll talk about. The end of the circle is Laodicea. Um, Jesus tells them in Laodicea, he says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. They're probably the most talked about church of the seven churches because of this statement. You've probably heard this if you haven't heard anything else. Because you say I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so you may become rich and white garments so you may clothe yourself. And that the shame of your nakedness will be revealed, and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who has overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The other thing that Laodicea is famous for besides black wool is eye salve. And they actually took this eye salve and they made it into pills. And they shipped it all over Asia. And the people would grind the pills up and make salve to put on their eyes. Laodicea was famous for that, for this eye salve. So Laodicea was famous for this eye salve. They were famous for black wool. They were extremely wealthy. But they were extremely unfaithful in God's eyes. So as we see this, Jesus says here, he says, I'm the amen. I'm the beginning of creation, the faithful and true witness. He tells them I'm the source, which is important because this really talks a lot about water, which is really kind of interesting. And I'm going to explain that to you here in just a second. Um, verse 15 and 16, he says, I know your deeds. Okay. He says, I know your deeds, that you are hot and are cold. I wish that you were hot or cold, because if not, I would, so I especially have a mouth. Now, the cold here in the Greek is chilled to the point of freezing. So we're talking about really, really cold. Now, I'm going to explain this to you in a minute. That's why I'm bringing this up, because it's kind of interesting with this church. 
hot here is what we call zestos, which means boiling hot, okay? So that he's talking about not just like hot and cold, but like boiling hot and freezing cold. Now there's a reason that he's saying this. And the reason he's saying this is because there's two towns next to Laodicea, Heropolis and Colossae. And Heropolis has hot springs, like the hot springs you go lay in, okay? Has hot springs. And Colossae has cold springs, ice cold springs. And Laodicea is in the middle. Now, like I said, Laodicea doesn't have any really natural water of its own. So it has to come in by an aqueduct. So the aqueduct starts out at Heropolis, which is hot. By the time it goes down the aqueduct and gets to Laodicea, guess what? It's lukewarm, right? In other words, it's lukewarm by the time it gets there. So the reference that John's making, even though it's a spiritual reference, it also has a physical backing in the region where this at, in the geography of this town, because this is something that really exists. He says the cold springs in nearby Colossae were refreshing. The hot springs of Heropolis were healing. Jesus making a spiritual point. A lukewarm faith is useless. But there was a physical basis to what they did because the time the water got there, it was lukewarm. Nobody likes anything lukewarm. Most people don't. I know I don't. You either want it hot, you want it cold, right? And Jesus is saying the same thing. If you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit it out of my mouth. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And so Jesus says that if you're cold or hot, you can be reached. Think about this with me for a minute. People that are lukewarm are impo almost impossible to reach. Do you agree with that? People who are in the middle are almost impossible to reach because they think, I'm all right, right? I'm okay. I'm going through the motions. I'm doing my thing. I show up for worship. I do my thing. I'm, I'm okay, right? But people who are cold, we can reach them because they know they're not in Christ. And people that are hot, they're always looking to do more, to be more, and we can reach those people. But the biggest problem we have in any church is the people who are lukewarm. The people who come on a Sunday morning, who fill the pew, who do their thing, do what they think they need for God, go home and don't do anything the rest of the week and come back on Sunday and go through the motions again. Lukewarm, right? Isn't that the biggest problem in any church is, is the lukewarm. We can't seem to motivate them past to, to, to pass that, to, to be more than that. So it's a danger for us. It's easy to get into that place. When Jesus talks about this, he's talking about going from hot to cold, not the other way around. Stuff doesn't go from cold to hot, right? You go from hot to cold, don't you? And if you're lukewarm, chances are you're eventually just going to fade away and become cold because we're not going to be able to reach you at that point. So you become cold. You're going tepid. You're going from hot to cold, right? So it's interesting how Jesus puts this. He says he's literally going to vomit. The Greek word here is emu. It's where we get emetic, the medicine we buy for kids to make them vomit. That's the root of that word. That's where that comes from. It's exactly the root word in the, in the Greek that Jesus is using here, the root word for the stuff you buy down at Walmart, whatever they call it, um, emetic. You'll have it. You're going to have it in your medicine cabinet just a few days. Trust me, every parent goes and buys like four bottles of that when they have a kid because you think you're going to have to use it at some point. Um, but anyway, uh, you're going to, that's the, the root of that word. So, uh, so that's kind of what he says. He says here, he says, um, well, this is a quote I had. Uh, it says, who is more to be pitied than an individual that imagines that he is a fine Christian, whereas in reality the Christ himself is utterly disgusted with him. You know, that's, a, that's the most dangerous state we can be in, isn't it? When we think, well, I'm a fine Christian, I'm doing my thing, and yet, and yet we're just lukewarm. We're not what God wants us to be. Um, okay, there we go. So there's implications here. When we think we have everything, we don't need God. This was an extremely wealthy city. That's why he tells them, go get gold refined by fire. In other words, he's the reference to their wealth. The gold you have is worthless. You need gold that's refined by fire. You need the spiritual riches. You don't need physical riches. And so he brings that up with them. He says there's three things you need. He says, number one, you need gold refined by fire. That means, the, the, like I said, the wealth you have is worthless. 
You need God's wealth. You need spiritual wealth. You need gold refined by fire. That's the first thing because they're really wealthy, super wealthy town, a lot of wealth in this town. The next thing he says, you need white garments. I told you they were famous for their black wool. And here Jesus makes a contrast. He says, you need white garments. You don't need black garments. You need white garments. It's a contrast to what they did. Black wool was their trade, so it's a contrast to what they did. And he says, you need eye salve. And that's important there because, like I said, they made eye salve there that they put in their eyes. And once again, Jesus says, you need eye salve so that you can really see. All these things are, are geographical and, and, um, and demographic references to this city. I think it's very interesting. And like I said, Laodicea is, is the most... It's the most quoted of the churches. Number one, because we always hear that verse, you either hot or cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. But also because I stand at the door and knock, and we always think of that painting with no doorknob on the outside, and if you'll open, I'll come in to you. He tells them to be zealous and repent. He tells them, I stand at the door and knock, but you have to open the door, right? Jesus says, I won't force my way in. That's kind of the thought of that painting and the, the illustration of this. I stand at the door and knock. If you let me in, I'm going to do it, but you have to do it. You have to let me in. I won't force my way into the door. He says, and those who overcome, he says, I'll let them set, I'll let them set on my throne. I hope as we've gone through these churches, I hope there's a couple of things that you've seen in these churches that will stick with you throughout this series of Revelation. One of them is, is all these churches were under some sort of persecution, um, none of these churches were without persecution, whether it was a synagogue of Satan, whether it was the Romans, whether it was, uh, the, the, whether it was pagan worship, whether it was the Greeks. All these churches were under persecution. All these churches, except two, had a lot of condemnation. But two of them didn't have any. Smyrna and Philadelphia had no condemnation. I hope you see these are real churches, literal churches. The ruins still exist to this day. These are churches that... John through that Christ through John referenced geographically and demographically that these are the churches. These aren't periods of time, periods of history, literal churches, literal people, literal time, and that's who this letter's going to. That the book of Revelation was not written to us, it was written for us, and we've got to approach it that way, and we have to ask what's the purpose of this book? What was Christ trying to do through John? Why did these churches need to hear what John had to say? And I think you can kind of see from these churches that they really needed some encouragement. They needed to know that God was going to win in the end. They were pretty discouraged. So I hope this kind of sets the stage. We're going to talk about these seven keys to understanding Revelation. I'm going to try to get some more books. They're out of print. I've got about a half a dozen I got from 21st century. I can get some more off Amazon, I think. They're getting hard to get. So I'm going to try to get some more books. I think David has one. I don't know if anybody else has one from before. If you do, look on your bookshelf. Uh, Seven Keys to or Unlocking Revelation is the name of the book by Stafford North. If you happen to have that on your bookshelf, dig it out. Because like I say, it's going to be kind of limited. I would, do li would like to see everybody get one of those books. I think it's very helpful to look back later on and to say, oh, I can understand this. It kind of really helps. Stafford did a really good job of of kind of laying out some things that's going to help us throughout the study. So we're going to talk about that next Sunday night, and I'll try to get some more books. Thanks for your attention tonight. If we can help you in any way, won't you let it be known while we stand.